but I, th I thought I would talk to you today about this topic of incidental bone lesions on chest and abdominal CT and kind of the idea about what should I do. This is a topic that comes up uh, pretty frequently or a situation that comes up pretty frequently. And, um, you know, we need to have kind of an approach to handling these things. And it does focus mostly on incidental bone lesions rather than, you know, patients with no malignancy uh, or things like that, that, you know, the, the lesions may not be incidental per se, but part of the whole disease process. So it's a case-based um, presentation. And um, we'll start with case number one here. And I'll give you a, a few seconds to look at the, the images and um, think about what you might do or what you might say in a case like this. This is a 26-year-old young man with urinary diversion. You can see the, um, the, the kind of conduit here, something with the post-operative changes in the uh, mid-abdomen. And then in his spine, see this large bony structure protruding off of the hebrew body here on these axial images and on this coronal image. Does anybody want to shout out what you think this might be? Let's look at a, uh, a different patient with kind of a similar abnormality here. This is a 55-year-old woman who had shortness of breath. She actually has some tracheal issues and a, a calcified lymph node. We can ignore that for the time being, but look at her scapula here. There's this lesion that comes off the scapula and between the scapula and the chest wall here, and then on a, a coronal image here. And so both of these entities are, are the same sort of thing. They're, they're exophytic from the bone. They're projecting out of the bone as opposed to being just inside the bone. And they're picked up incidentally for these patients. Um, so on one hand, a spine lesion. On the other hand, um, a, a lesion on the scapula. And so these are osteochondromas, right? Or exostoses, more generically speaking. Here's another example of one in a tibia radiograph with this mature looking stalk leading to this kind of cauliflower um, ending of the lesion here. And it's, a, it's good to be aware of these because they're, they're fairly common. Um, they need to be continuous with the underlying bone. And if you look at like MRI and CT, they usually, you can see the marrow cavity and continuity with these. Um, they can have irregular loosened areas on the end of them, like this one here off the spine. And basically what, what these are is they're, they're bone, but they have cartilage on there as a cartilage cap. So osteo, so bone, and then cartilage and exostosis means they're sticking out basically, right? So they're, they're almost always benign, but they can be malignant and represent a chondrosarcoma. Um, the incidental ones we detect are likely to be benign. And what we try to do on MRI is look at the cartilage cap, which I'm not showing you here, but how thick is the, the cartilage outside the bone? Thicker is, is, is worse. So more than two centimeters, you may have malignancy, but thin, thin cartilage caps are almost always, always benign. More often, what can happen is they cause mechanical effects. So something like this one around the knee could cause like uh, bursitis, or they may impinge on blood vessels or nerves and cause symptoms related to those types of things. So osteochondroma. Um, hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you, like, if you see that incidentally and you're the first one to see it, do you get an MRI to evaluate it? Like, would you recommend that? So I don't. Th I don't think you necessarily need it. Um, you can. You can try to look and see if you can see any signs of like a lucency on the end of it um, on CT, like in this one in the spine. You might be able to tell. You know, if there's any additional tissue here that's different than the muscle. But but I think in general, if if you were to detect something like this and it's you know substantial in size, MRI is definitely the next best test to further investigate it, whether or not it has a cartilage cap or not. Another factor to keep in mind is that it's true that the, the patients that have multiple hereditary exostoses um, are much more likely to have malignancy than 
than the patients with a incidental um, solitary excess doses. So that might that might influence you as well. Thank you. All right. Second case. <clears throat> so you're in a busy ER night. You're doing your 80 year old woman with chest pain coming in for her her PE study, um, and you look at the upper part of the image here, and there's this abnormality in the left humerus. What do you think? What are you going to do? Chondroid. It has the arcane ring appearance. Awesome. Thank you, Malika. Um, yeah, it looks it looks good for that, right? Here's the normal marrow cavity, and then here's some kind of arc-like density. Um, here uh, you have thin sections too, so these are the thinner cuts. So you can see some some lucency, but with this irregular um, density inside. Here's the coronal reformation. So you know, this is kind of an ant mini thing. If you see that, it's like, oh, that looks like a cartilage lesion, like a chondroid lesion. Um, so then you have to have kind of an approach for these things as well, because they can be they can be benign and represent an enchondroma, or they could be malignant and represent a chondrosarcoma. So this gets to this whole business about chondroid lesions. And so, so there is this spectrum from enchondroma, low grade to high grade chondrosarcoma. Again, usually when we encounter these things incidentally, like in this older patient, they're going to be um, an incidental enchondroma or really low grade. They become more concerning if there's actually aggressive radiographic features. And so this one that I put down here has endosteal cortical thinning, um, some breakthrough actually here. And this lesion, you don't see much matrix anymore in that calcified matrix because it's kind of a more aggressive soft tissue lesion. Um, this one here as well, um, endosteal thinning. So those are aggressive radiographic features um, that make this more likely a chondrosarcoma than an enchondroma. Um, so things to look for are, are for aggressive features are the cortical scalloping or breakthrough, or if you see a mass, um, is a lot of it non-calcified? Or if you happen to be following one of these on radiographs or CT, do you see more non-calcified component occurring over time? Uh, is it growing? Is there pain? Bigger is worse. So lesions bigger than two centimeters uh, are, are more worrisome. So um, it's, it's important to remember that on histology, if you biopsy a lesion like this one, it can look identical between a low-grade chondrosarcoma and an enchondroma. So really the radiology is the important distinguishing study that tells, tells about the management and whether to decide that it's a low-grade chondrosarcoma versus enchondroma. If you have a legitimate chondrosarcoma, though the histology on those is gonna be overtly aggressive and it's gonna be like, oh, that's a malignancy. But on the lower grade ones, it doesn't necessarily look like very malignant tissue. So that's an important thing to remember. Um, so, you know, you'd want to get more history. You'd want to know, oh, does this patient with this lesion, do they happen to have a history of malignancy? Because that'll change your thought process because could that then be a, a metastatic lesion? Uh, you may want to follow it. Um, bone scans are not terribly helpful. They're only helpful if it's negative because many of these are going to show some low-grade activity. So something like this case, you might end up saying, you know, likely a low-grade chondroid neoplasm um, you have to correlate for pain. You want to know about any history of malignancy. And then if it's a CT scan like this, you may want to get baseline radiographs. And depending where you're practicing, you may want to get an orthopedic consult to get further management um, recommendations. Okay, so we saw an osteochondroma, the excess doses. These are enchondromas, so out, not, not outside the bone, but inside the bone. Um, so they're likely to be benign. You can do MRI and radiographs for further workup, and, and you can use our clinical consultants for more management um, recommendations and follow-up. Next case, another busy night in the emergency room. Um, you just mind in your own business, and two, two patients come in. Um, 
both with abdominal pain. Here's a 56 year old man and here's a 94 year old man coming in. They both have lesions in the region of the left femur. So here's a pretty well-defined high density sclerotic lesion in the left femoral neck. This patient also has a pretty well-defined sclerotic region in the left femoral neck. Maybe it's a little bit more irregular. What could it be? What are you gonna do? Um, here's a little more description and some coronal reformation. So the younger man here, pretty well-defined lesion, right? No destructive changes, uh, no extra lucency around it. It doesn't, doesn't have that typical chondroid kind of look to it like that that enchondroma that Malika diagnosed. Um, this other patient, the older man, has lytic changes in addition. So here there's some osteolysis and there's osteolysis here, and then there's this sclerosis here. So this is gonna be more, more concerning, right? Um, so just the features of these lesions will help, help dictate how, how concerning you should be, how concerned you should be. Um, this man had probably some diverticulitis, this man actually had a history of prostate cancer. So you have to then really worry, is this a prostate cancer metastatic lesion? Cause he's got a reason to have that. So, so the reason to show a case like this is that just as on plain radiographs, um, you wanna have an approach to analysis of focal bone lesions and the, the same patterns play out for radiographs as they do for uh, CT scans. And so you can go from a non-aggressive end of the spectrum to really aggressive. And the non-aggressive end are things with well-defined sclerotic borders like this cartoon. So the black here would be a white sclerotic border to a well-defined lesion without a sclerotic border to less well-defined to kind of multifocal or moth-eaten. And then the, the worst, you know, most aggressive is kind of a permeative appearance that things that can play out on CT as well. So the more, the more you are down this end of the spectrum, the more likely things are to be malignant. Um, although things like infection and lung or hand cell histiotitosis, things like that can also have an aggressive radiographic appearance. So here's some, some radiographs, um, non-aggressive, so well-defined sclerotic border, well-defined, but without that border, less well-defined, multifocal, you can think about what disorder this patient may have, um, or permeative where it's just eating away the bone. There's really no question that this is gonna be uh, an aggressive kind of a lesion, a malignancy. This particular patient, multifocal calvarial lesions, you could think about certainly metastatic disease or myeloma. Um, I think this was a patient with metastatic lung cancer that had extensive bone metastases. So back to our, our patients. Um, so this, the 94 year old man had this uh, sclerotic lesion with some lucency as well, hard to see on the plain radiographs. He had a bone scan done that shows markedly increased activity. So that's concerning for, for activity. Um, however, he actually had a normal PSA. And so patients with prostate cancer often will have elevated PSA in the setting of uh, bone lesions, and he did not. So um, he ended up undergoing a biopsy of this. And indeed, it actually did turn out to be a metastatic prostate cancer, but it was a, of an uncommon variant of kind of a neuroendocrine variant of prostate cancer. Um, so it didn't necessarily have that uh, increased PSA. So. Another just thing to think about is if you have a lesion that's causing some bone destruction is, is what's the risk of fracture. And even though you know, it's not a good prognosis to have bone lesions uh, that are malignant, it, a patient may benefit by oncology, orthopedic oncology to consider prophylactic fixation so they don't have some uh, morbid outcome from these types of things. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> So I would say, think about it this way. If, if, if you look at a lesion and it appears non-aggressive, it probably is. So things like a large bone island or potentially an area of fibrous dysplasia could give this look. Um, other sclerotic lesions, um, you know, areas of healing fracture, things like that, potentially chronic infection could look fairly sclerotic. Obviously the clinical history is really important. So we've got to pay attention to that. <clears throat> 
So if you're reading this CT scan in the outpatient setting or inpatient, whatever, um, you might say, well, there's an incidental non-aggressive appearing lesion that looks benign, almost certainly benign. Um, you may not be quite done there. You might wanna think, well, what could be useful for following this up? And, and plain radiographs could be helpful if you didn't have those already just as a baseline, because you don't wanna have to be repeating CT more often than you need to. MRI is always a good test to consider. I wouldn't say you have to do it every time, but if you did an MRI in this patient and it's a well-defined low signal lesion, without any bone edema, without any periosteal reaction, without any soft tissue mass, you can be pretty reassured that this is just an incidental <clears throat> benign lesion. And a um, patient like this, we know, uh, when have, have, have followed him for several years, uh, just clinically, because he, he is uh, well, well known to us and uh, it's been completely uh, non-aggressive non, uh, and asymptomatic. <clears throat> Chris, I had a quick question here um, for the bone island. Sure. Do you ever find that Hounsfield unit can be helpful um, in differentiating them? I know some resources cite that like a Hounsfield unit in like a thousand is more indicative of a bone island. Do you think that's true? Yeah, no, that's a good, I'm glad you brought that up, Emilsa, because it's true. Um, it's helpful. Um, and there have been some papers fairly recently that looked at like bone islands and measured radiographic uh, CT density, Hounsfield units, and found that, you know, above a certain level, things that are really dense are almost always benign. And I forget the number. Some, somehow I want to think it's around 1400 is the, the number that's been proposed by the Mayo Clinic group. Um, of course, like everything, it looks good in the first paper and then it doesn't look so good for other things. But, um, but really high density is reassuring that things are going to be benign. Um, and some, something around that order of magnitude, like around 1400 or something, would be you know, a good cutoff. So if, it's something, if you measure 1600, 2000, things like that, that's almost certainly going to be benign. <clears throat> a follow up question on Bond Islands, Dr. Bolu. Uh, yeah. do, do they have like irregular borders, bone islands, or? Yeah, they often do have irregular borders and um, kind of a stellate appearance, um, like little star. They can have kind of align with trabeculae to some extent, like the, you know, the, the center of gravity or whatever, the, the long axis of the bone island may line up with the trabeculae within the bone. So. And they're extremely common. So if you're looking at, you know, ERCTs and things like that, you're going to see bone islands very frequently. And so you, you'll get a sense of what they look like. Um, the other thing is that obviously things that are small and solitary tend to be innocent. If, if, if you have numerous things that are small, like, you know, five, 10, that's not such a good thing, but, um, but single lesions that are small and dense, almost always going to be incidental benign things. Thank you. Sure. Um, okay, next case. <clears throat> this gets into a little bit of a different scenario here. So here's a man, prostate cancer. He's getting his uh, prostate MR workup and has this lesion detected in the left anterior acetabulum on this T2-weighted image. Um, contrast was administered, and so here's the, here's the pre-contrast image, and here's a post-contrast image. Um, and so we see that there is an enhancement in this lesion, so we can tell that it's a, you know, definitely enhancing lesion. It's probably a solid, you know, uniform uh, solid lesion. I only hesitate a tiny bit because sometimes cystic lesions with synovium inside them can look like they're enhancing and almost be solid. But in any event, this, this is suspicious, right? Prostate cancer and a focal enhancing bone lesion. What are you going to do? Um, <clears throat> bone scans are quite helpful uh, in many situations. So here's this patient. He underwent a radionuclide bone scan, tech MDP, the traditional tracer. And this was from the report. It said, possible subtle increased uptake in the left groin, recommend correlation with cross-sectional imaging. 
Well, that's a little bit annoying, right? Because we it sort of already had cross-sectional imaging. It's kind of uh, not, not, not that helpful. And boy, the scan is like super difficult to interpret, right? This is bladder activity. Here's this area of activity in the left groin region, but it's not like a slam dunk for metastatic disease. Um, so it's just really not helping us too much. And in fact, this report's kind of punting the whole situation back to, uh, to the radiologists and like not helping the clinicians. So it's like the, the punt is the most important play in football and it can, be, it can be useful in radiology too to kick it back to somebody else, but ultimately you wanna come up with an answer, right? Um, so this, there's a tool that we can use now and uh, in the right setting for more specificity. And so here's a fluoride ion PET um, that's really great for bone. And so this same patient, bone scan itself looks pretty normal. Fluoride ion PET, very intense tracer uptake in that primary lesion we looked at or that, that main lesion, numerous other lesions in the spine and elsewhere. So pretty definitive diagnosis of metastatic disease in the situation. So, um, so ancillary tests like bone scan and PET can be very helpful, um, especially fluoride ion PET can play a definite nice role for these more challenging cases. Um, and I wanna thank Andre Iagaru for these nice uh, nuclear medicine images. Um, so that also gives us the benefit of the cross-sectional um, imaging, right? So here's that MRI that I showed with the lesion in the left acetabulum. And here's the corresponding PET activity showing very intense activity. There actually was a smaller lesion in the right posterior acetabulum here that probably be even more difficult on MRI that lit up like crazy on the PET. So that's, that's pretty unequivocal that these are gonna be metastatic lesions. So are you gonna do fluoride ion PET for every patient you want a bone scan on? Um, probably not. It's a higher cost examination than a bone scan. Um, it actually takes less time, I gather, to do the imaging, so that's a convenience. Um, but I think, and I think this is probably still true, that in, in staging prostate cancer, if you're looking uh, at um, a bone scan, it's still part of the workup. I don't know if PSMA scanning, how, how that's exactly fitting. It's obviously a moving sort of target about what's the best uh, imaging for these things, but the fluoride ion PET can definitely play a good role for uh, looking at bone lesions these days. All right. <clears throat> There's about 10 total cases. So just to give you a flavor and we're doing doing like pretty well on time. So here's another one, like another, another uh, fun night in the ER, 86 year old man, you know, fell down some stairs or something and you, you, you get that pelvic CT because the radiographs are horrible and you see this lesion in the, the right iliac bone. What, what do you think that could be? Is that going to be like a metastatic lesion or you know, could it be a chondroid tumor? Um, it doesn't have that chondroid matrix. It's fairly well defined. A um, little bit hard to know. Pretty large lesion, right? So it, it's hard, hard to know. I think if I had to bet on something like this, I'd say, yeah, it looks probably more well-defined and benign or non-aggressive at least than, than overtly aggressive. Um, <clears throat> here's a different study on the same patient. So let, let's say he got a um, CT scan that was more focused on lumbar spine. So here's another cut of that same lesion, or maybe I just zoomed in on it. I forget what I did here, but, but there's actually a big defect in the bone here, right, posteriorly. Um, so that, is that aggressive? Uh, there's a little bit of a defect here as well. Um, so you, you could worry about this. Um, it turns out that a lot of times, this is the area where surgeons take a chunk of bone from patients. So this is actually just an iliac crest bone graft harvest site. And I would say the, the key thing is, and I, I see this not infrequently, is people show us a case and like, what is this lesion? And you look in the in packs and you, you find, oh, well, they had a cervical spine fusion surgery. And so they needed to get bone graft from somewhere. They had a lumbar spine surgery. 
and so they take bone from the pelvis. There's a lot of bone there. And, and typically what they do is they'll take it from the posterior aspect of the iliac crest back here, or they'll take it from anterior. They tend not to take it from like right along the, you know, your, your hip colloquially, the hip crest here because of nerves that are there. So take it from the front or from the back um, and it'll lead to a bone defect. Um, so you need to just be aware of that. Um, you can have complications from the bone graft harvest as well. Um, and I'll show that in a second. So, um, so here's our, our patient, that lesion in the ilium on the right. Another thing to remember is look at the internal attenuation. So here's, here's um, a Hounsfield measurement of minus 26, right? So what, what density is that? Fat. So that's that's fat. So uh, tumors are not typically going to have fat. Like lipomatous tumors of bone are are really uncommon. So if you measure fat in it, it looks similar to subcutaneous fat. That's almost uh, certainly telling you that this is a benign lesion. So so be sure to think about measuring the attenuation. Um, here's a couple of other cases. So here's one on the left side. There's like a cortical defect in the uh, left iliac wing in this patient. Um, here's another patient with kind of a funny looking right iliac wing. There's some sclerosis. There's also like concave outer table here. And sometimes they will uh, take, take bone out uh, and then they'll have extra, they'll put it back in or it'll heal in and it'll look like this after a while. So these are again, both bone graft um, harvest sites. Um, sometimes things don't go, don't go well. Um, here's, here's a, like, this is not going to be incidental, but this is a patient with a bone graft harvest that had been done. Then they ended up with like some nerve symptoms in the left lower extremity. And it's because they were super aggressive and took a huge chunk of bone of both the ilium and the sacrum. And then they, they repacked it back in. And like this piece of bone is like in the uh, S1 foramen. That's, that's not good. Um, also known as bad. Um, so uh, you, you don't want to have that happen. Um, you can also have one of those anterior grafts or a graft anywhere. You can have a little bit of bleeding afterwards. And this looks like, oh my God, there's like a lytic you know, lesion or soft tissue mass eating away the bone there. You wouldn't know that, that it was just a post-op complication unless you knew that the patient had a bone graft harvest in that area. So things to be aware of bone graft harvest sites. <clears throat> Often you'll see they will have fairly smooth borders and that, that cortical defect that I showed here, even though there's a missing part, it's pretty smooth, like rounded and smooth, kind of going with a benign thing and look for that fat density in things like fat here and then fat here. Um, and sometimes they do get packed with extra graft. A definite kind of pitfall. Um, here's another one. Okay, 34-year-old man, left hip pain comes in. It's like, uh-oh, he's got like some lucent lesion in the left hip here. Uh, right hip, and it looks pretty good. <clears throat> it's good to think about where you are. Like, is this, this is around a joint, right? So it's around the hip joint. Um, and we have nice data, right? So you can do nice reformations. And so here's thin cut axial. And then here's some reformation uh, in a coronal plane. And we see that this, this lucent looking lesion in the left femur that's kind of got a peanut shape. It also has like a dot of gas in it here, probably dot of gas here and it's lucent. Then if you back up a little bit, you realize that his femoral heads are not normal on either side, right? Like there's some extra sclerosis here. And then the opposite hip, there's kind of a band of sclerosis maybe a little bit of lucency, and this is probably the physis, but this is, a, this is not a normal look of that hip, and it's not normal on this side either. So this patient has a certain uh, disorder. Does anybody want to venture a guess as to what this is? Take a look at his MRI scan. So here we go, um, did the left hip MRI and um, there's that CT with the sclerosis, that lucency, which turns out on MRI, it's fluid filled, fluid filled there. Cartilage is all 
kind of worn out there. Got this subchondral low signal. It's not really that flattened, but um, but this is classic, pretty classic for what? Osteonecrosis. A yeah, osteonecrosis AVN. Awesome. Okay, excellent. So here's his opposite hip. This is a little bit more of maybe the kind of textbook example where he's got this sclerotic border in his right femoral head. Um, and then on PD MRI, it's like low signal rim around it, not so much bone marrow edema at this stage, maybe a little bit here. So it's a more chronic appearance of AVN in this patient. And usually if you have a patient like this, you can find somewhere in their chart, they've been treated with steroids or they may have sickle cell anemia or some other risk factor for avascular necrosis. Um, here, so here's a different kind of a companion case. So um, history of colon cancer, also had a history of lymphoma, bone marrow transplant. Um, <clears throat> when you're reading CTs, be sure to spend a second looking at the femoral heads, right? So here's, here's this funny looking geographic pattern on the left and patchy stuff on the right. The coronals really help you in that because it shows that kind of typical subchondral epiphyseal abnormality in AVN. Um, synonymous with osteonecrosis. If you have other lesions that are like bone infarcts, you may see these rim-like lesions like in this man's pelvis here and sacrum left pelvis on coronal as well. So these are multifocal areas of osteonecrosis in a patient with some risk factors, um, probably especially the lymphoma often treated with corticosteroids, the bone marrow transplant maybe contributes to that as well with more steroids involved. So <clears throat> AVN. Um, they will treat this with core decompression. And so basically trying to relieve the pressure in the femoral head. So they'll basically core out some bone here to try to relieve intraosseous pressure. <clears throat> you can see the loosened core here in this patient. It get, it's probably too late once it starts to get this arthritis here. <clears throat> but this also reminds us that in AVN of the hip, um, think about things that cause increased marrow pressure. And that can be um, things like excess fat deposition, which is something that happens with steroid treatment. Um, you can get it with other, you know, fat depositing disorders or marrow packing disorders that cause increased pressure within the marrow. Maybe that's also why deep sea divers are supposedly, you know, at higher risk for AVN because of increased intraosseous pressure. So basically, the idea of this core decompression is just to like <clears throat> give a give a pressure relief, like pushing the uh, pushing <clears throat> the valve stem on your on your bike or your car uh, to release uh, air out of the the tire. Um, a different patient, real quick, she's too late. This is also more advanced AVN uh, patient with leukemia. Again, a big steroids involved there. She's like a lot of arthropathy involving the hips with some debris and effusions in the joint. Um, so if you see things around joints, it's important to kind of think about, oh, is this an articular disorder, um, you know, rather than a primary bone lesion per se. Um, so <clears throat> Definitely take advantage of the reformations like coronals. Um, and uh, that, that's basically what I want to say about AVM here. <clears throat> um, 74 year old woman, history of lung cancer. She's got these lucent lesions around the hips here on both sides and a lot of narrowing of the right hip joint space. So she's got some sort of arthrosis, arthropathy, of some sort, could be just osteoarthritis, could be something else. Um, and here's a different patient who has a, a renal mass. See the solid renal mass on the right? That's almost always gonna be renal cell carcinoma, right? Um, but he's got this lesion in the pubis on the right side, this focal lesion here and here. Maybe it has some fat density in it. Couldn't quite tell. Sometimes if things are small, it's hard to accurately measure the density. Uh, but nonetheless, the uh, urologist in this case is like, you know, should I try to do some kind of, uh, you know, radical surgery or take out this renal carcinoma? Is it is going to be helpful if the patient's got like a bone metastasis? Um, 
So, you know, this becomes really important to know what, what to say, what to do. <clears throat> um, it gets back to the point about things that are around joints, right? So here, in the case of this woman with lung cancer, we don't know really what this entity was, but, but what we could tell was that in addition to the arthritis, the narrowing, we could actually see some little perforation between the joint and leading into these lesions in the bone. So this could be like just complex cyst formation in the bone, like big geodes forming from bad arthritis. Um, on the left side, you can't really see a perforation, but there's this almost like fat density within this lesion. So again, features that look pretty benign and connecting to the joint, that's also very helpful. So um, description that I just um, talked about here, so uh, benign looking features, I mean, could look kind of concerning, but um, they're right around the joint. And similarly for this one, right around the symphysis, it's next to the symphysis. Um, and we thought we could see like a little perforation, probably hard to see here, but connecting between the joint and the bone. So that's just gonna be a cyst in the, in the bone. And so, you know, if you had multifocal lesions, you'd have to start worrying more, but if this is an isolated thing around like a mildly degenerated pubic symphysis, you could be pretty confident that this is just an incidental benign lucent focus and should not negatively impact his ability to have a, a curative uh, renal resection. Having said all that, they may take that kidney lesion out no matter what, even in a patient who had you know, metastatic disease because maybe that helps the overall you know, outcome anyway, but, but you get the idea. So keep in mind lesions around joints, they're often joint related and you get these cysts and geodes, look for those cortical perforations like this one. Um, the thin sections, multiplanar reformations really can be helpful uh, in that analysis. A different scenario, here's a patient we know, okay, she gave us a history, she's on peritoneal dialysis. And you look at her scan and you have pubic symphysis here and here on this kind of oblique reformatted MR, uh, sorry, uh, MPR CT scan, <clears throat> super indistinct sacroiliac joint here, here, all this extra calcium around the pubic symphysis. So the the clue really to this disorder is this patient's on dialysis. So she, you know, she has renal, renal failure. Um, <clears throat> and looking a little bit closer to the pubic bone, there's actually this area here, which is like a rounded focus with a fluid level. That's like fluid, fluid, fluid level with some calcification in that fluid. So all this basically points to, you know, metabolic derangement in a patient with renal uh, renal failure and could be renal osteodystrophy. Um, and basically think of it as disordered calcium metabolism that, that occurs because of that. And so you end up with these, these uh, bone findings of uh, renal osteodystrophy. Um, super irregular SI joints here and this patient, same thing here. You know, you could think about maybe infection, but usually don't have the density with that. And here's the peritoneal dialysis catheter. Um, this can get fairly extensive. So here's a different patient with all kinds of calcification along this left iliac, uh, iliacus uh, mus musculature, iliopsoas, extending down into the thigh. You know, you could, you could probably want to think, oh, could that be like a big cartilaginous or maybe osseous neoplasm? Um, <clears throat> but it follows along the muscle there and it looks like calcium. And so it's a good look for um, extra osseous kind of calcification in a patient with renal failure, like, uh, you know, extensive, like so-called tumoral calcinosis. It looks like a tumor, but it's calcification. Uh, here's like the state fair champ version of that. This patient had like more calcinosis than you can uh, possibly imagine. Um, and so about both hips, um, both femurs, uh, this might be a fibroid here, but that's that's extensive calcinosis and renal failure. The classic thing you might also see in the spine um, is like rugger jersey spine, where it's like more sclerotic density, lucency, and sclerosis looking like those kind of striped, you know, jerseys that uh, I guess rugby players use and, uh, you know, wear and, and things like that. So here's one case. Here's another case where more end plate irregularity in the, uh, in the spine. <clears throat> 
<clears throat> so renal failure can lead to disordered calcium metabolism, hyperparathyroidism, you know, is part of that, and renal osteodystrophy. Um, you, you obviously usually know that if the patient has renal failure, that they get these complications like calcinosis, brown tumors, which are typically like lytic lesions that can look quite aggressive. They get the subparasurial absorption, things around the hands, and then all kinds of different um, entities that may show up on a CT scan or x-rays as well. <clears throat> all righty, couple more to go here. Um, 45 year old man, left hip pain. Comes to the ER one night, you're minding your own business, Grubhub's on the way, and you're like, damn, <laughs> right? Uh, call the bone room, because you found that there's this lytic loosened area in the left acetabulum here. Maybe there's one there, I'm not sure, but there's this thing, and here it is here. So if you see something like this, you should, you should worry, right? Because this is something that's eating away bone is not generally not good. <laughs> here's, a, here's my motto. I don't want things that are eating away my bones. Um, so a lytic lesion, there's no matrix. There's really not a defined soft tissue mass that we can detect here. This is operator internus muscle next door. <clears throat> um, this patient had a chest abdo pelvis CT scan or that, that maybe that followed because it's like, uh-oh, he's got a malignancy. We've got to screen him. Here's his T-spine this area of this lesion, it's a little bit indeterminate, right? Because on one hand, it's radiolucent, but it's also got this sclerotic border, mostly lytic on the, on the sagittal reformation of that same lesion. Here's a different lesion in the T-spine the here, uh, lower T-spine, here it is on sagittal. So kind of multifocal, somewhat aggressive looking lesions throughout the skeleton. So that should trigger, you know, thinking about, well, probably not going to be good, you know, or odds are, unfortunately, it's not going to be good. It could be metastatic disease, could be multiple myeloma, could be many things. Um, and it basically takes you into this category of things that are multifocal lytic or lucent lesions that I would just say, you need to get to the bottom of these, right? You don't, can't usually just say, well, they're probably nothing, <laughs> um, because usually these things are not good. And here's the list of, of uh, suspects, METS, myeloma, could be lymphoma, infection, definitely, Langerhans cell, histiocytosis, those disorders, um, rare things like cystic angiomatosis um, can, can occur. Um, so, you know, a patient like this needs further workup, needs to get something biopsied probably. Um, and we'll get, get to that in just a minute. Um, you know, then you, if you're reading that scan, you've got a lot of information, right? You got whole chest abdomen pelvis. Well, look for like what are the what are the suspects that could be causing multifocal uh, bone lesions? And so here's sort of my list of things, and it's like a, a long list. Of things could be lytic, could be sclerotic. Um, these are fairly common tumors, right? And and some things are, could be either, like lung could be lytic or sclerotic, same as breast. Um, Things that are almost always lytic is going to be like renal, thyroid, HCC, um, things, and there, but there, there can be some, some overlap. Um, remember maybe that renal, while well, it's always almost always lytic, transitional cell carcinoma is almost always sclerotic. So even though it's a GU malignancy, they're not going to behave the same. And there's some disorders that we know basically are less commonly associated with bone spread as listed here. Um, of course, it doesn't mean they can't be, and so you'll see exceptions to this, especially if patients are treated for a long time um, and have maybe different clones of things coming after them after a long time, but less likely. So our 45-year-old man um, had that lesion on the, in the spine and underwent spine MRI to try to assess it a little bit further. So he had a diffuse decrease in his bone marrow uh, fat on T1-weighted imaging. That's not not normal, but it was fairly normal on STIR, except for that one area, that vertebral body. Enhancement post-contrast, and then pretty extensive enhancement in the vertebral body and the pedicle with some soft tissue component post-contrast. So 
I'm not sure this is really telling us that much more. It, it's certainly not reassuring us. It's basically, you know, this looks like an aggressive process. It probably has some soft tissue mass. And again, we need to get to the bottom of it. Um, it turns out, um, and I forget if I go down that road again, let me go back to this guy. So he ended up undergoing a biopsy. I think one of those um, pelvic lesions that I showed in the beginning got biopsy. This turns out to be longer Hans cell histiocytosis in a 45 year old man. So kind of an aggressive, you know, not a, not a, not a primary or metastatic malignancy, but something that causes multifocal lytic lesions. The other big player besides METs uh, is myeloma. And, and we see that fairly frequently. Um, people talk about these CRAB symptoms. So calcium elevation, renal dysfunction, anemia, and bone pain for myeloma. Um, so here's a number of myeloma lesions, these focal lucencies kind of just took a bite out of the bone here, right? Lucency here, lucency in that table there. Here's a bigger lesion in the femur. So that's actually causing some cortical destruction. That's clearly aggressive. So things like this, that could be metastatic disease, could be myeloma, usually some lab tests and other knowledge of any primary or detecting a primary is gonna help you uh, determine between those two things. There's weird stuff as well, right? So here's a case from a uh, friend, Peter Glickman, of uh, a patient, of course, he's got prostate cancer, right? So he's at some risk, but he's got all these multifocal lucent lesions in the bone, fairly well-defined, um, fairly well-defined. <clears throat> and other uh, images here, big lesions in the sacrum. You measure some of those, they're actually fat attenuation. Turns out this is hemangiomatosis. So multiple hemangiomas within the bone. Kind of cystic angiomatosis is similar. So you could, you, you know, can always get end up kind of getting a, a rare bird coming into your uh, reading room that's not what you think it is. So, uh, uh, but I want to show you an uncommon case. So again, bottom line for these multifocal lucent lesions without a sclerotic borders, they really, you really need to kind of come to some diagnosis. Um, Mets and myeloma, but you can have infection or LCH, things like that, rarely hemangiomatosis. Always remember to look for fat because that's helpful if you see fat within a lesion. Um, last case, I do have a couple of bonus cases um, if we get to that point. This one's another one that's a little bit involved, but so here's a couple different patients. Um, one, one man came in with abdominal pain, let's say he's in his 40s or so here. Um, this patient was like a roulette pneumonia kind of thing or evaluate a known pneumonia. So on this patient, there's a rib lesion, right? And so it's kind of like expansile, some sclerosis. Um, yeah, it kind of looks kind of aggressive, right? Um, wonder what that's gonna be. Uh, as opposed to this one, which is, is this something you might even not even notice? It's a little smudgy thing, um, type of thing. <laughs> we get shown fairly often. It's like, well, what are you going to do with that? Usually, these well-defined things in the ribs are. Uh, remember, always remember fibrous dysplasia in the ribs. It's fairly common. So, but you know, part of a workup. Let's say this patient had breast cancer. What if he had a male with prostate cancer? That's a little bit concerning, right? Um, so you want to know, is this an isolated, solitary thing, or is this a multifocal process? Um, so this man with the incidental rib lesion, that was concerning. So he got a bone scan, and it showed that there's some activity in that area. So that's probably helpful that you know it's not just completely quiescent. So that probably keeps you concerned. There was actually a different lesion on the opposite side. So all of a sudden you're dealing with something that's kind of multifocal. Um, and it turned out he had several other lesions as well. Um, and so he had this lesion in a different rib that's pretty aggressive looking. Um, he had lesions in the pelvis that are kind of mixed sclerotic and lucent and sclerotic and lucent. And I think you'd be hard pressed not to say, well, this looks kind of very concerning and kind of aggressive, right? Because could be, it could be something like <clears throat> metastatic lung, prostate, breast, neuroendocrine, um, a number of different bad actors. 
So the uh, decision was made to biopsy this rib lesion with the biggest soft tissue mass, which was um, done by our capable uh, neurointerventional folks. And uh, turned out that this was, uh, ended up being all fibrous dysplasia. So kind of multifocal fibrous dysplasia. Um, and I think, you know, going back, this is a different patient than Than this one. So this one that I showed, this is a different, same as it's also fibrous dysplasia, but this one with the multifocal and the big rib mass was indeed uh, multifocal fibrous dysplasia, but needed to get a biopsy done in order to be confident about it because it looks pretty nasty. So I guess don't feel bad if you have to biopsy something to know what it is. Um, multifocal mixed and sclerotic lesions often include METs and re remember things might change with treatment could be a lymphoma, you can get multifocal fibrous dysplasia and remember these syndromes of like McCune-Albright syndrome and Mazabrode syndrome, that's when you have fibrous dysplasia associated with um, soft tissue myxomatous lesions, if I remember right. You can get infection, osteomyelitis, and weird things like angiomatosis. Uh, we do see fibrous dysplasia quite, quite a bit. It comes across the bone board um, and to the tumor uh, orthopedist, like pretty big lesions here, but they're usually well-defined, can have that ground glass kind of matrix within them, kind of expand style often with ground glass kind of attenuation on CT as well. Here was a scary case of a young, young woman, like Stanford uh, student, just wanted to get certified for scuba diving and got a screening chest radiograph. She's got this huge mass. It's like, that's not good. Um, so she ended up with a CT scan. And the CT shows this big kind of caterpillar-like lesion expanding this rib with this kind of swirly densities within. It looks probably fairly chronic because of its, the way it's expanding a lot with thinning, but not like overtly aggressive features. Again, remember, remember fibrous dysplasia in ribs. So she, she underwent an MRI to be even more certain. And so what we could see on the MRI was that lesion on T1 pretty low, T2 fat suppressed, kind of heterogeneous, but definitely some low signal areas, which is good for like fibrosis. Some enhancement, not unusual, um, but a good look overall for fibrous dysplasia. You know, doesn't mean she shouldn't probably get followed up with um, cross-sectional imaging or a chest radiograph at least in a few months to make sure things are not changing, but um, don't want to put her through a biopsy unless you really need to. So fibrous dysplasia. Um, but life isn't always so straightforward. So here's a man uh, with lung cancer and known metastatic disease. And so here he was at one point in time and you could see this lesion in the right ilium. It's got sclerotic border, shaggy, irregular margins. Um, and then here it's about the same, maybe it's a little worse. Here later, he gets treated, gets a little bit more compact looking. So. Again, you're going to see this. If you see patients with uh, cancer follow-up, it's like, yeah, oh, it's got that lesion in the right iliac bone. That yeah, looks pretty benign, doesn't it? Well, it looks pretty benign or non-aggressive now, but it looked pretty nasty before it got treated. So, so always be you know, thorough and go back to prior imaging studies because you'll see the time course of these things and know, you'll know that's a treated metastatic lesion and not just some incidental thing like fibrous dysplasia, for example. Um, one other thing here, so that we see these really dense, this is similar to that, that man I showed with appendicitis and the left femoral lesion, these things, we used to call them LSMFT, like liposclerosing mixofibrous tumor, big mouthful. It's probably a, a term that's no longer uh, appropriate to use with kind of a fibroosseous lesion, well-defined, this will be really high density, no aggressive features, and, and is probably like a, sort of a fibrous dysplasia kind of situation and often incidental and, and not really aggressive. Um, another kind of cute thing you'll see is intraosseous lipomas. So particularly in the femur here is the radiograph. So here's the uh, lucent lesion, sclerotic borders with this kind of rounded internal calcifications. Um, and then a different patient on CT. So a well-defined lesion. See how it's, it's destroyed or, you know, occupying the trabeculae within the left femur? 
compared to the right, which is normal. Notice this too, internal matrix or density, same as fat. So if you see fat in things, almost always going to be benign. So fibrous dysplasia things, pretty common. If you see a rib lesion, you should always kind of think of that. Um, of course, you can have other bad things too, but fibrous dysplasia is fairly common. The MRI can be helpful with low signal on it. Um, you may really need to biopsy something like this because you really can't tell um, that it's truly benign. So <clears throat> big, big take home points from the whole case conference here is, um, you know, we'll see these incidental chondroid or osteochondromatous lesions, look for aggressive features like cortical destruction, try to assess the cartilage cap if you need to do an MRI, you could do that. You want to use the same principles for he is used for radiographs, like well defined up to really aggressive. You know, it's going to become more likely to be uh, malignant. <clears throat> I mentioned a little bit about fluoride ion PET CT, although I know really nothing else about it, but it's a good test that's in our kind of toolkit now for assessing bone lesions better than regular old bone scan. Don't forget about those bone graft harvest sites. Um, they can really be a pitfall. It's one of the more common things that we see and get asked to look at. And the first thing I always do is look in the packs and see if they've had some sort of surgery involving a bone graft elsewhere. Fat, almost always benign. Etiology can be helpful, sort of your friend. Um, things around joints, always think about the joint and uh, use your MPRs and things to assess the joint and the regions around it. Uh, renal failure um, has some funky things that go on, but usually associated with that calcium metabolism issues. And then fibrous dysplasia is kind of a mimicker of many different things. It's common and it can look somewhat aggressive. So it turns out there's a lot of stuff there, right? But uh, with the right kind of approach to things and putting the whole patient together, you can have a pretty good approach to incidental lesions on CT. Um, <clears throat> I have an analogous talk that uh, is on incidental lesions on body MRI, um, I'm happy to give at some point too. <clears throat> and if you wanna see a couple of quick bonus cases, um, I'm happy to uh, show them that. So yet another MSK thing. So here's a woman again, come into the ER, um, you know, with flank pain. So you're looking for that diverticulitis, uh, renal is, you know, colic, she's gotten contrast, so maybe you've decided it's not just a stone case. Left flank pain, <clears throat> always think about the spine, right? Think about discs. And if you're really, really sharp, like Simon Abramson, who was a fellow a few years ago, he's like, is that like a disc over there? So I was like, well, maybe. Um, so you have thin sections, and admittedly, this is pretty tricky, but Here's a five millimeter cut. Here's the vertebral body. There's a little bit of soft tissue density, probably like a disc bulge of focal protrusion there. Probably here, admittedly pretty tricky. Here's a normal level. <clears throat> anyway, flank pain, back pain, patient um, is gonna end up with an MRI shortly, but um, here's the reformation of the spine showing that disc protruding into the exit foramen at that same level. So it's good to look at that, you know, in the setting of pain, there it is here. And on an MRI that was done a couple of weeks later, you can see this disc protruding. You know, we don't always know if that's the exact cause of her pain, but it definitely correlates with the CT and something to think about if you have a, these patients coming into the, um, <clears throat> coming in with acute pain. <clears throat> Last case here is one where a patient had um, undergone hip arthroplasty and they had bilateral lower extremity pain. And, um, you know, the bones look okay, nothing focal in the bones. There's this kind of white thing here. I'm not quite sure what that is, but, you know, and oh boy, too much streak artifact to say too much about the uh, arthroplasties, especially bilateral, it's always a problem for CT. Um, but if you carefully window level this thing and say, you know, I'm gonna work beyond the arthroplasty, that thing, on the right is actually the screw from the arthroplasty sticking beyond the bone posteriorly and right into um, the sciatic nerve sitting right back here. So here's axial, here's a sagittal reconstruct, here's this, here's this fixation screw 
all the way through the bone, right into the nerve. You need to know where the nerve lives. It lives right in here. Um, and it turned out the story with this patient is she'd had this arthroplasty done like a couple years before. And like in the recovery room, she had severe, <coughs> severe sciatica type pain that they, <coughs> they, they sort of discounted, but she continued to have pain. And then and it was quite some time until she came and had this study that's like, well, maybe it's because the friggin' nerve is being, you know, screwed. I guess that's the one verb, but, but uh, put, you know, by this huge orthopedic screw that's in the nerve. <clears throat> they went in and um, here's, the, here's the cartoon of where the nerve is right behind the acetabulum right there. So good anatomy to know. They went in and, and a neurosurgeon at orthopedist, they went in and sawed off, you know, took off that piece of the, the screw that was impinging. Unfortunately, her nerve was too badly damaged at the time and she didn't really recover any good function. So that's a little bit of a strange case, but um, another uh, <clears throat> iatrogenesis fulminans kind of a case is what we call that. Um, so that's a quick tour of some incidental bone lesions uh, for you this afternoon. And I hope you'll learn some of that. I actually wrote a paper on this too, and I'm happy to, um, email that out to you, um, covers a lot of these same, same cases, the topics, and that could be a useful reference for you to have when you're, when you're struggling with these incidental lesions on CT.